Do you think so? The Bible says, whithersoever we eat or drink or whithersoever we want, do. Is dressing something that we do, yes or no? Do you know that the way we dress becomes a duty on the, of the congregation on the day of atonement? And the question is, do you think that it's all right to dress the way we dress now inside the most holy place? Not only do we get hair reform, but we get dress reform when we go back into the most holy place. And if we reject dress reform, cut off. Now, my brothers and sisters, you ready tonight? Or you got to go home tonight? You want some more tonight? Are you sure? Let's go in our Bible to Luke chapter 8. What book did I say? Let's go to Luke chapter 8. Let's go to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. And you hold your thumb in Luke 8. It says, fashion is deteriorating the intellect and eating out the what? Spirituality of our people. Do we need to be spiritual in the day of atonement? Yes or no? It's a holy convocation. It says obedience to fashion is pervading our seven day Adventist churches and is what? Doing more than any other power to separate our people from what? On the day of atonement, should we be separate or at one? So that means that we've got to get fashion out. Fashion can't, you see, you can't bring it to the place. You see, there are things that you can wear in the outer court that you cannot wear inside the most holy place. We've got to walk in there by faith and by works. Now, my brothers and sisters, you will find out that it's amazing to me that it used to be that when you talked about fashion, you thought you only had to do with sisters, but do you know that men are becoming more fashionable than women today? The men are walking around with uh, 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 mirrors in their back pockets. It's amazing looking at himself more than his woman is looking at herself. It's amazing that, that we're doing the same thing today. The devil has confused us. There was a time, listen, when the woman, I remember being in a store, and the, a, a woman was in a store, but at the airport, and the woman was going to the airport, and all of a sudden she didn't think nobody else was looking, and she started running, 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 and then she stopped, and she sat down quickly, looked around, took her shoes off, started rubbing her feet because she knew her, the shoes she was wearing was not fit for her feet. It was because of fashion. You see some of these shoes, they go up so high, it makes the woman almost fall over. And we don't understand that these fashions are controlling us. Do you know that if you were open your eyes, your shoe would tell you, practice dress reform. Your feet would tell you, take me off. Now, you don't know how your feet talk. Let me translate. When you get corns on your feet, your physiology, your body is telling you, my shoes are too tight or the wrong shape or too high. It's not the way it should be. And when your foot gets the bunions and the corns that you want to get manicured up, it's because your feet are telling you, please, refer me. My brothers and sisters, the same thing is going on now. And let me tell you something. Years ago, you know the day that the rap stars are making our brothers look like women today. The brothers are putting on skirts to be like some of these Kane East or Kane West or whatever his name is, Kanye, whoever. That we're putting on all this just racing like them. And right now the day they're brought into the world, they brought into the world something called skinny jeans. You know what a skinny jean is? You see our brothers walking around. You know, 10 years ago, you couldn't get a brother to wear skinny jeans. Well, the only one that were wearing skinny jeans, well, uh, he was the one that people call funny. He wasn't the one that was straight. He was the one that the devil had confused. My brothers and sisters, you ever seen a man trying to walk in skinny jeans? He can't, he walked like this. He can't even move. And you better understand because the skinny jeans expose things that shouldn't be exposed. And you better understand physiology. Women are not stimulated by sight. Women, lady, uh, women are stimulated by touch and by sound. The ones that are stimulated by sight are men, which means that the one who designed your clothing are men that got stimulated by which... I'm trying to make it plain without going over the line. Do you understand? Try to be as discreet as I can. We're told that this will come in, and it's sad enough that it's in the world, but that has entered the church, and they brought in something called skinny suits. The man's suit is so tight, he can't even walk in the pulpit. His, his, he thinks he's showing off his body. His, his suit is so tight, he can't even lift up his hand. How are you going to preach the three angels' message? How 
Why do you want to give the trumpet a certain sound? He can't even put his hand to his mouth. Well, the only thing he can do is be quiet. And that's what the devil has done. He has made the skinny suit itself disarm the message for this time. But God calls for revival and for reformation. My brothers and sisters, whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, whatever we do all to the glory of God. But you must understand today, the devil not only knows the way men work, but he knows the way women work. And so what the devil has done, the devil knows that we like to look nice. And so he's created a fashion that exposes our bodies. You must understand, but you can't do that in the most holy place. In the most holy place, we must cover ourselves before the Lord. In Simulation says, no education can be complete that does not teach right principles in regard to what? Dress. Education 246. Our universities were supposed to teach this before there were universities, but we don't teach this no more. My brothers and sisters, our churches were to teach this. Do you know that if you were to teach this, that we could save our women from many of the diseases? You know, we used to say, if a woman looked good, she had to look like a Coca-Cola bottle, like this. <laughs> now you tell me what organ of the body is like that. You look at the physiology, that, that the 50 percent of diseases in the woman could be stopped. Would you like to stop 50 percent of diseases in a woman, yes or no? Yes. Watch now. Here is what we're doing. We, we wear the tight clothing that it makes us look like a wasp. <laughs> don't, no woman naturally looks like a wasp. I don't think no man should be attracted to a wasp. We well, got a lot of wasps flying around here. But my brothers and sisters, when you're dressed like that, what does it do to the organs of the body? It perverts and destroys the organs. They can't work properly. And as a result, it destroys the digestive system, which is the main causes of all of our diseases today. Now watch this. The prophet says, Helpful Living 123, many have become lifelong invalids through their compliance with the demands of what? Fashion. You know many things we would not do if it was not for fashion. We wouldn't wear some things that went for fashion. You tell me the truth, young sisters, older sisters. You know when you come to church, you prove this. The Sabbath morning, you have a shoe that you wear for church, but you have another shoe. Am I right or wrong? You have the shoe that you wear when you get into your car. You got the shoe that you wear once you get out of the church and you think nobody else saw you. You slip the shoe off and you put on something comfortable and your feet say, praise God. <laughs> Displacements and deformities it says, look, look what it says. It says, this dress called displacement deformities. What else? Cancers and their terrible diseases are among the evils resulting from fashionable dress. A hospital will never tell you that. A lifestyle center won't tell you that. But a sanitarium will tell you that cancer can be caused by the way we dress. Do you know, brothers and sisters, I can tell you now that there's some things that, that we dress when we have on the spaghetti straps that is causing problems to the breasts right here because it destroys the circulation. And perfect health depends upon perfect circulation. Now, my brothers and sisters, you understand that there are many diseases in the uterus that happens to women, and they think it's just because of their lie. But do you know that when you wear high heels, or when you start wearing, lifting up the heels above one inch, above two inches, you get the three inches, it lifts you up so high physiologically, it puts you out of center with gravity, so something goes forward that shouldn't go forward. And something goes backward that shouldn't be backward. And as a result, it puts tension on the spinal cord and the back, and you have back problems and don't know why. You have uterus problems because the uterus is thrown out of position with the tilt that's unnatural, and there are diseases of women due to fashion. Well, if we only correct the fashion, we'll be healthy and holy, ready to go in to the most holy place with Jesus. My brothers and sisters, inspiration told us this, and this is a man by the name of Joe Cruz. You don't know who Joe Cruz is on Trinidad, do you? One of the greatest evangelists among seven Adventists in modern times. He wrote a book called Creeping Compromise. In this book, he quoted from one of our papers. This is no offshoot. This is a seven Adventist. Look what it says. He's quoting from October 4, 1945. It's the official world paper of our denomination. And notice what it says. It was talking about, it emphasized in the article that these actions represented principles held by the church through long years. But let me tell you something. What the church believed back then, we don't even believe today. This is 1945, and in 1945, you study seven Adventists were already in apostasy, 1945. But in 1945, it's, I'm going to show you what they said under the section of amusements. Do you want to know what we taught from the Bible and the Day of Atonement? Watch now. You read it? Are you sitting down? Let's watch. Surely what? Surely no one preparing, not one, preparing for the coming of Jesus will be found at the Lord. Now our universities are taking people to theaters. 
Our churches are taking people to theaters. Our homes are going to the cinema and bringing the theater into our house. But how can we set that which is wicked before our eyes? Psalms 101.3 says, set no wicked thing before our eyes. It says, the carnival, the what? That carnival that comes on this island, we'd have no part in it. It says, the movie house, the opera, the circus, the dance, the card table or in attendance at commercialized what? Sports. We strongly urge separation from worldly associations at skating rinks. Not that skating was bad, but when we are brought into worldly what? Association. And what does it say? And what? Public bathing beaches. This is what we believe from the Day of Atonement. Let me tell you something. Every time I go to an island, one of the first things they tell me is, are you ready to go to the beach? I say, no. I am not a fool. You say, what do I mean? Let me make it plain to you so you understand. What do is being worn at the beach? Talk to me, somebody. What does our beautiful sisters have on at the beach? Let's be plain. All they're wearing is a panty and a bra. Am I right or wrong? It's a panty and a bra. I'm just making it plain tonight. It's a panty and a bra, brothers and sisters. Now, on the beach of Trinidad, you know that's what's there. On Tobago, you know that's what's there. It's in America. It's in every beach in this world. And let me tell you something. My brothers and sisters, it's amazing to me that in your house, if you were to wear a panty and a bra and a brother were to see you, you would say, But then you get on the beach of Trinidad and you start strolling. How, how in the world did it get so modest at the beach if it was so immodest in your house? No reformation by the beach. No change by the beach. I'm telling you what the truth is. And tell me something, sisters, tell me something. If you have a husband, do you think it's safe for your husband to look at a woman who's wearing a panty and a bra? Then how do you think it's safe for him to go to the beach and watch it? with their hundreds beside them, not on a, a video, not on the a, a, a internet, but in live, in flesh, and in Trinidad, they, they, some of them don't even want to look at him. They want the man you have. They want the woman you have. You better understand that the devil is tricking, brothers and sisters. And this type of clothing that we wear goes on in the church. You know what this says? ABC. ABC News, World News. Look what it says. This is, it says Victoria's Secret Model. You know what Victoria's Secret is? Yeah. Now, now, some men shook their head too fast. It needs to be a secret to the men. Amen? It says Victoria's Secret Model quits to reserve body for her husband. She says this model, uh, model uh, Kylie, has decided to leave Victoria's Secret because it clashes with her Christian beliefs. I just became so convicted of honoring the Lord in my body and wanting to be a role model for other women out there who look up to me. She says, and I wonder, she doesn't know anything about the 10th day of the 7th month. She doesn't know anything about the most holy place. She doesn't know anything about the spirit of prophecy, the Bible like this, and she is willing to do this. My question is, like Jesus said, have the children of the world become wiser than the children of light? This says, I was doing my makeup in the mirror one day and when someone her family was watching her little girl she looked up at me and was like you know I think I want to stop eating so I can look like you it broke my heart because she looks up to me and I didn't want to be the type of person that she thought she had to do to be, be beautiful she said thousands of girls that think that being beautiful is an outer issue when really it is a what do you think that was on the outside makes you look beautiful the Bible said what's beautiful to God is that which is in his sight is a meek and quiet spirit first Peter tells us that my brothers and sisters, do you know that you cannot put makeup on in the most holy place? Jesus, oh, the devil don't like that one. Yes, Heavenly Father, give us more power. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, when you put that makeup on, it takes us back to Jezebel. You will find that was the first time you see people painting their faces. In Jeremiah, uh, in Je 2 Kings 4, verse 30, it talks about Jezebel painting herself, putting this makeup on. But let me tell you something. In the most holy place, we're to keep the commandments of God. Do you know what the ninth commandment says? What does the ninth commandment says? Thou shalt not bear a what? False witness. In other words, don't lie. Makeup is a what? Lie. 
I mean, when, when a child lies, what you say? What you say? You say you made that up. You know what you tell him? Yeah. Well, when you put that makeup on, you made it up. Yeah. It's a lie. It's not real. Do you think that putting paint on your face makes you look more attractive to Jesus? Now, if you did not know this, does God condemn us? There are many sincere Christians that have never been taught this, and God does not condemn us, but he's trying to show us that in the most holy place, he's bringing us back to true beauty, and true beauty is not on skin deep. True beauty is not on the outside. True beauty is on the inside. Many husbands would have never married their wives if they saw their wives without husbands or without makeup on. And that should never have been. That means that they don't know what they have. Are you with me? Some wives wake up and put makeup on and never let their husband see them. Let me tell you something. You say, well, my face doesn't look right. Well, do you know that your face has little pores on them, which are little mouths, and when you put makeup in it, it clogs it, kills, so the flesh can't breathe and your skin dies. That what makes it look so bad when you take it off. But do you know that in a medical missionary sanitarium, there's something that you can do to massage and put what is called a salt glow on the face. And what would happen, it will make your face shine brighter than any rouge or paint or makeup that you can put on. You see, that which gives color to the skin is the blood. And you know what we're doing? Because we have a problem with circulation in our face, we try to cover it up on the outside, but as in the natural, so in the spiritual. We're trying to fix our beauty from the outside in instead of the inside out. The way to get the color is to bring back blood to the face, and this happens because we're not exercising and doing what God has said that we are supposed to do. My views were calculated to correct the present fashion. The extreme what? Now, first, Sister White, not today, but years ago, that the long dress and the prophet and the Bible had to correct that. The dress used to look like that. You see that? And that's extreme. Is that right? Look how long it is. You see what it's doing? It's treading the ground. Can you imagine walking with that? That's a burden walking through Trinidad. It will pick up the dirt on the filth of the street. It will pick up the mud. It will pick up the water. It will hit the ankles, bring dirt. It will bring all diseases. It will chill the ankles, mess up the circulation, destroy the health. But this was the fashion of the day. But my brothers and sisters, the prophet says, no, no, no. We didn't cover, but that's too extreme. That's not it. The prophet then told us they need to not. And it's amazing. The prophet stops that extreme, and it looked like we didn't get the lesson. And so we made it too short instead of too long. To correct the extreme, not only the one trailing up on the ground, but also to correct the extreme what? Not just the short dress, but the what? Extreme short dress. Now, if I would ask you in all of the schools they used to teach that when you wear something that is modest, it should at least reach your what? What text is that in the Bible? What statement is that in spirit prophecy? Where? No, the prophet says, it says, the extreme short dress reaching about to the what? So this is not, when the dress reaches about to the knees, this is not a short dress, it's a what? So what would the prophet say about the extreme, the mini dress of today? It says, I was showing that we should shun both extremes. You know, if I had enough time, I would show you where the short dress came from historically. If I had enough time, I would show you from the Bible. If you study this, because when, when, when man sinned, the first thing they did was that the light that covered them went out. Is that right? Genesis 3 said that they made a fashion. What type of fashion? Anybody know what it says in Genesis 3.89? They made a fashion with the leaves. They didn't just put the leaves on. They made the leaves into a particular fashion. They fashioned the leaves into a particular style. You know what the style was? They made a what? A plan. And you will find that the fig leaf of yesterday is the fashion of today. Do you know the apron exposes? If you study the apron, the apron has been around for nearly uh, 6,000 years. The masons that are a secret society, where masons you study encyclopedias, you'll see an apron has looked the same for nearly 6,000 years. You know what the apron exposes? You look at the apron. The apron exposes the cleavage on the woman. Apron exposes the arms like a spaghetti strap. The apron exposes the back. The apron exposes the back of the legs. It exposes the thighs. This is what apron exposes. This is what Adam and Eve dressed. Did God accept that style of dress? Yes or no? He said, you're still naked. And then he gave them Jesus. Praise God. What do you say? He said, I promise you. He gave them the hint of redemption. He said, a seed was coming. Jesus was coming. And then, after he gave them the plan of redemption, he brought them back and changed their dress and made them coats to clothe them because the Bible says they were naked. Genesis 3, 8 through 21. That's what the Bible says. Now, my brothers and sisters, inspiration says the limbs were not formed by our creator to endure exposure as was the face. 
You see, when we don't cover ourselves, do you know that we prevent perfect circulation? Someone says, but I can't cover myself in Trinidad. It's too hot. Isn't that what you said? In the cold time, yes, but it's not like that on Trinidad. Where is the hottest place on earth? Talk to me, somebody. The Sahara Desert is the highest place on earth. Do they wear mini skirts in the Sahara Desert? Do they wear short sleeves in the Sahara Desert? Why not? Let's read it. Why do people, what do people wear in the Sahara Desert? Desert people usually wear lightweight, loose fitting clothes. Generally, it is light colors. It often covers the what? Face and all, this is due to the harsh desert weather being sunny. So even when it's sunny, do you know that actually covering yourself makes you cooler, not hotter. If you ever did landscaping, I used to do landscaping, you will see that those who do landscaping in the hot, they will actually cover their face and their bodies when they do it because it covers them from the heat and protects them. This is the hottest place on earth, the Sahara Desert. It says the temperatures sometimes get to 136 degrees. That's temperatures that the Trinidad or Tobago have never seen. So don't use that excuse there. It's, it's what God says. It says, in humility and unutterable sadness, they bade farewell to their beautiful homes. This is when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And went forth to dwell upon the earth, which rested the curse of sin. The atmosphere, once so mild and uniform in temperature, was now subject to mark changes, and the Lord mercifully provided them with a what? You see, the fig leaf fashion would not have covered them and protected them. So it says he made them garments of skin as a protection from the extremes, not only of cold, but the extreme of what? So covering protects us not only from the cold, it protects us from the what? Now somebody says, well, I'm not going to participate in the duty of the congregation of the day of atonement. Cut off. Now my brothers and sisters, all through, I can show all through, all through this, it shows us this. Then it shows us how it used to be. I want to ask you a question. Everything in the world that's viable, you know what we do to it? We cover it. We buy a cell phone. We pay hundreds of dollars for the iPhone 20 or the Galaxy 1000, and we pay for it, and guess what we do? What do we buy for that cell phone? We buy what? A case to cover it. We get a car, a new expensive car. We don't want the rain acid to mess it up. And so what do we do for the car? We buy what? Cover. Women, you pay some good money to get your hair done. Amen. And it starts raining outside. What do you do to your hair? What do you do? You cover it. Everything that's valuable, we cover. And the most valuable thing of our women, we don't teach them to cover themselves because they were bought with a price, not condemnation, but education. My sisters, you are beautiful. Do you know that you are princesses and queens, that you are, your price is far above rubies. And when you know your value, you cover yourself. And what a woman does not need is not condemnation. She needs to be showed how special she is. She needs to be showed how much she is, how valuable she is. And then she will cover herself and let the fathers and let the brothers and let the men of the church respectfully in their appointed places to the ones that they should tell our sisters, tell our daughters, tell our wives that when men see them exposed, do you know that a man, when he looks at you and you expose your legs and your body, he's not saying, this is a wonderful, wholesome wife to raise a family with. I know what he's thinking. You know what he's thinking. I can't tell you what he's thinking from the pulpit. And you know I'm telling you the truth. Everything is fire we covered. Does God condemn us? No. He wants to say that we've been bought with a price. Now my brothers and sisters, there was a time when we knew all over the islands that women didn't dress like men, nor that women dressed like Men dress like women or women like men. You know right now today that we used to know that in our churches that women do not wear pants. Do you know that in the most holy place, men don't dress like women and women don't dress like men. Men don't act like women nor do men act like women. Someone says, well, I can't, not in Trinidad, I can't work and do that. Well, you don't know the history of Trinidad, do you? They had slaves in Trinidad. Am I right or wrong? They did more work than you ever thought about. Right here on this island. You know how they dressed when they did that work? Look at the picture. You know how they dressed when they did that work in America and all around them? Look at the picture. 
slaves in America, they dress, they cover themselves. Even if you didn't look that exact way, you can't tell me you can't do this work. My brothers and sisters, do you know that in the most holy place, you cannot cross the dresses? You know why? The prophet has told us. Deuteronomy 22, verse 5, write it down. Deuteronomy 22, verse 5 says that women are not to wear that which pertaineth to a man, and a man should not wear that which pertaineth to a woman. It is an abomination, and we're told that if you want the seal of God, you must sigh and cry for all of the abomination that is brought into the house of God. And just as homosexuality is an abomination for a woman, and just like a man, the Bible says, is an abomination, and we want the seal. Is that right? Now listen. God designed that there should be a plain distinction between the dress of men and women and has considered the matter of sufficient, sufficient importance to give explicit directions in regard to it. I told you, Deuteronomy 22, 5. Then it says, for the same dress worn by both sexes would cause what? I wish we had time tonight. I got to get ready to bring to a close. I wish we had time tonight. But in Leviticus 18, the Bible says the confusion was brought all throughout paganism. You'll find that the reason why Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy was talking to Israel as they were getting ready to go into a promised land. He said, don't do like Egypt. Don't do like the pagans. Because the pagans, do you know that they were trisexuals? You know what a trisexual is? The pagans. The pagan, the man, not only had intercourse with women, heterosexual. He not only had intercourse with other men, bisexual, but he had intercourse with animals, trisexual. You know that was going on today, and you know that one of the things that the pagans did to make it easy for men to become homosexuals and women to become homosexuals, they developed a unisex clothing so that men and women dressed the same so that you could not tell the distinction between a man and a woman, and then it wasn't hard to commit homosexuality. And the prophet says that when this would happen, confusion and great increase of crime would take place. In fact, the prophet says we would see homosexuality rise again when you see unisex clothing. And what do we see today in this generation? Homosexuality. Do you know that in Trinidad and Tobago, it was not brought into seven Adventist churches before the 60s. Everyone knew that you don't do this as a Seventh-day Adventist. Eating, drinking, and dressing all have a direct bearing upon our spiritual advancement. Whatever we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, do all to the glory of God. The Spirit of God cannot come to our help and assist us in perfecting Christian character if we don't eat, drink, dress, and live according to the glory of God. Does eating, drinking, and dressing make us sinless? No. It allows us to afflict our souls and to do our part so that Jesus can come in and do his part. Do you know that when we confuse each other, we destroy the beauty of God? Let me tell you something. Every sister, you in Luke 8, every sister knows this. The Bible says in Luke 8, let me read this, verse 26 and 27. Luke 8, verse 26 says, And they arrived at the country of the Gadareans, which is over against what? Galilee. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had what? Devils what? Long time and war no what? So when the devil comes in, you will notice that one of the first things we do is to begin to take our clothes off and begin to expose our bodies. What do you think is one of the first things when Jesus comes back? We begin to do what? Cover ourselves. You'll find that in verse 35. Now, listen, listen to me, sisters. I want to tell you something a bit. You know, we're told that dress reform is a, not a burden but a blessing. It's to be a shield from a thousand evils. Listen to me. Have you ever been to the market? Have you been to the market here in Trinidad? Any, anybody ever been to the market? When you expose flesh, what type of things does it draw? Flies. Let me tell you something. Listen to me, sisters. When you expose your body, you will not get a man. You will get a fly. Now, someone say, how do you know you got a fly? Let me tell you how you know you got a fly. A fly, last time I checked, doesn't have a job. A fly will let he will play video games at his house and let you work to support the family. A fly will get you pregnant and then let you take care of your, your baby. A fly will fly out on you and leave you by yourself. That's not a man, that's a fly. Males are born, men are made. My brothers and sisters say, well, well, I got hair on my chest, I'm a man. Someone say, well, I drink alcohol, I'm a man. I can make fornication, I'm a man. I can make it, no, don't make you a man. Listen, someone say, well, well I, got, I, got, I do got hair on my chest. Listen, just because you got hair on your chest, it doesn't make you a man. A cow has hair on his chest. A chicken has hair. Why, why even a baboon has hair on his chest. A man looks like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. What do you say? 
And when you come to Jesus, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says in verse 35, Luke 8 verse 35 says, Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed sitting at the feet of where Jesus what? Clothed and in his what? That means that when you come to Jesus, he's going to clothe you and make you see some dress reform. He's going to make you put on some new clothes that cover your body because you were bought with a price. My brothers and sisters, inspiration is clear that God has given us this message. Inspiration tells us, well, I better pass on this. You're not ready for that one. Let me keep going. Let me, let me keep going. Let me keep going. What has to happen to flesh in the most holy place? It's got to what? Go. What has to happen to the media in the most holy place? That media that controls the devil, it's got to what? Go. We got to be changed in the image of Jesus. What about jewelry, brothers and sisters? It says the Bible teaches modesty in what? 1 Timothy 2, verse 1. In like manner, the women also adorn themselves in modest apparel. Write it down. 1 Timothy 9 says that we do not wear gold or pearls or costly array. That's 1 Timothy 2.9. That's Bible. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that on the day of atonement, jewelry comes off? It's a duty of the congregation on the day of atonement. It says, if the prophetic Christian world, enough is expended on jewels and what else? Needlessly expensive dress to feed all the hungry and to clothe the what? Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know what that says? That says, not in the whole world, but just in the professed what? Christian world. Enough is expended just on jewelry and things that you don't need that could feed all the hungry and clothe all the what? Now, does Jesus ever talk about those that will not feed the hungry and clothe the naked? Who did he say they are? They're goats. He said, the one that says that, 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 that Jesus was there, and he was hungry, you didn't feed him. He was naked, you didn't clothe him. He was a goat. He was put on his left side, shaken out, cut off. But do you know the inspiration says that if we didn't spend money on the jewelry and this fashionable dress that the Bible condemns, that we would have enough money to end world hunger just by dress reform. We could stop world hunger tonight. It's a solution. Now, my brothers and sisters, if a person has jewelry on tonight, does God condemn them? Yes or no? You know, there are many Christians that have never been taught this. But do you know, if you go back 100 years ago, every Christian church used to teach this. The Baptist church taught it. The Pentecostal church taught it. Do you know there's still Pentecostal today that don't, don't wear jewelry? There's still holiness church today that don't wear jewelry. Church of God today don't wear jewelry. It was a part of the Bible belief. But my brothers and sisters, compromise stepped in. And the only thing that can hold us is the day of atonement. But now among seven Adventists, jewelry is crept back in. I'm going to tell you how. Because young people, you can't fool them. See, young people are not going to be hypocrites. You and I will be hypocrites as adults, but young people say, look, give it to me straight. No, young people, when they hear this message, they love it. They wake up, they say, I want to do what God said. See, young people are already used to looking different. Look at the green hair young people are wearing. Look at the mohawks young people are wearing. Look at the clothing young people are wearing. So today, young people don't care about being different. It's the adults that are afraid to break through with the tradition and fashions. You tell the youth the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and an army of youth will set Trinidad on fire. Now listen to me, brothers and sisters. You want to find that it says that this cannot be worn inside of the most holy place where we have spiritual amnesia. We have forgotten who we are. But you know what happened to young people? They saw a bunch of hypocrisy. You know, a jewelry wasn't large in our church a long time. But in 1986, you'll find out that the 80s, that all of a sudden young people started putting on earrings and necklaces. You know why? Because we said that in the most holy place, it was all right to wear a wedding ring. Now young people say, wait a minute now. Wedding ring is what? Talk to me, young people. What's a wedding ring? It's jewelry. So a young man says, wait a minute. A young woman says, wait a minute. If they can put on a wedding ring and an engagement ring, I can put on an earring. I can put on a necklace. Don't tell me I can't wear jewelry. You're wearing jewelry. Someone says, it's not jewelry. It's a wedding band. Where do you buy it? In the candy store? My brothers and sisters, you must understand, does God allow wedding bands inside of the most holy place? They said, Jesus, you're preaching too hard. I got to tell you the truth. They said, well, they'll never bring you back. It's all right. I got to tell you the truth. In the most holy place, this is not acceptable. Inspiration says, self-denial and dress is a part of our Christian what? 
It is a duty of the congregation on the day of atonement. It says to dress plainly, abstaining from display of jewelry and ornaments of how many? Every kind is in keeping with our what? Faith. It's the day of atonement. It's the anti-typical day of atonement, brothers and sisters. Now, question, did go back? Remember, the most holy place is to bring us back. Someone says, well, well wedding bands save marriages. Listen to me. If wedding bands save marriages, then Hollywood would still be married. Everybody in Hollywood has bigger rings than you could ever dream of having. But their marriages are just as bad. In the church today, you can see people with wedding bands on that are still divorced and have adultery. Wedding bands don't talk. Wedding bands don't bring love. Wedding bands made of gold do not save homes. One man said to me, well, the wedding band reminds me that I'm married. Well, if you need a wedding band to remind you you're married, you shouldn't be married. Did God give to Eve a wedding band in the Garden of Eden? Talk to me somebody. Be careful. Listen carefully. Yes. House band. Husband. Band. Ephesians 5.25 says, One husbands love your wives. Look what it says. Fathers have an important part to act. The husband is the what? House band of the home treasures, binding by a strong, earnest, devoted affection, the members of the household, mother and children together in the strongest bonds of what? You know that the husband is the true house band. Do you know that I try to remind my family, if my wife had a wedding band on, I would almost want to say, get that out of here. I'm the true wedding band that's trying to take my place. I try to remind them morning and evening when we do our devotion, after we do our devotion, I grab my family up and I hug them and say, remember, I am the house band. And I squeeze them until all of a sudden their eyes bug out. <laughs> now I say, you won't forget it. I'm the wedding band. It says he is to bind by his strong affection the members of his household. His name, house band, is the true definition of what? Husband. I saw that but few fathers realize this responsibility. Do you know that if more men understood this, there would be no more broken homes? Women right now today, there's young sisters, they're going at the flies. They're going at the brothers whose head, pants are hanging down, and they're just having their shirts open up, trying to show their chest. Put the birdcage away! And they're trying to show off this way. But if a man, you know women crave for affection. And you know that they were to be supplied by father. Father was to hug and love his wife. You see, when a person is hungry, they will eat out of a garbage can. And our women today are getting married, having sex before marriage because they want affection. They want this. And if we will teach our daughters and our wives and give them love and affection. I take my daughter and I start kissing her. And I kiss her and she, and then we have something when she's four. She says, I'm four. And I do like a gas station. I top it off. Then when it's topped off, she says, it's done. You see, when a child is full, they won't starve and go after men that are not men at all, but are males that don't know Jesus. But this, God's true in man is the man who loves his wife and the woman of love that is bound by the bond. But in the most holy place, this does not belong. But in 1986, Seven Adventists used to teach this. I'm telling you, Seven Adventists used to teach what I'm teaching you now. But in 1986, a group of men got together and put in a church manual that it's all right to wear a simple wedding band, but no text was added. Inspiration says... Testimonies to the minister. Every minister wants to read this. I feel deeply over this. Not one penny should be spent for a circlet of gold to testify that we are married. That's what the prophet says. And in the most holy place, we must embrace the writings of the law and the prophets. It's in the Bible. It's in the spirit of prophecy. And I don't care what man says or what tradition says. Anybody know? If you study history, you will find out that the wedding band actually came from Rome. And then it came from paganism. It says it all from pagan origin, sanctified by adoption, entered into the church. It does not come from the Bible. Now, my brothers and sisters, anybody know who that is right now? Who's that? Who's that? You know who that is. He was once over this country. His family line. This is Prince Williams. You know what happened a couple years ago? Prince Williams got married. You know that, don't you? Now, you notice that there, what's wrong? What, what, what's right about this? What's right about this? You don't see why. And it's not accidental. Watch. Prince William refuses to wear a wedding ring. People magazine, not a seven evidence magazine, worldly magazine. People magazine quoting sources, Prince William isn't going to wear a wedding ring. I get that some men don't like jewelry of any kind. He knows his jewelry. It says for him, a bearing finger, Prince William is going to eschew hate the modern day what? He knows his tradition of men wearing wedding bands. 
spokesman said, it's not going to be this. Now I want to ask you a question. He doesn't know anything about the Day of Atonement, nothing about the Bible, nothing about the most holy place. Have the children of the world become wiser than the children of light? And someone says, then what shall we do? You know, I wish we had time, but I got to close. I'm well past my time. I, and that's your fault, amen? amen? But now listen to me. There's a relationship between wedding bands and the national son in law. Now, God didn't condemn us if we didn't know this. But I'm going to tell you something. On the Day of Atonement, we were supposed to understand this because when the same law passes, judgment passes from the dead to the living. But you must understand something. If we had time, I would show you from the Bible's of prophecy that a seventh Adventist who learns about the Day of Atonement and continues to wear a wedding band, he will receive the mark of the beast. No question. I got passed on now. My time is away. Inspiration says a connection between this, where it came from. I got to pass this right now. I got to keep going. But you know what inspiration says? Inspiration tells us. Not only did they not go to public bathing beaches, the same article took a strong stance against jewelry and stated specifically, let's read together, no circle of gold should be worn as a testimony to marriage vows. This is what we used to believe in 1945 as a church, but something has happened. But do you know, it's the Day of Atonement. You know what Yom Kippur means? Day of Atonement. This is a Jewish high priest. Uh, this is a Jewish priest talking about the Day of Atonement in our day, this generation. Look what he says about Yom Kippur. It says, Yom Kippur is the holiest day of the what? It is a day of abstention. That means fasting like we talked about. This is this generation. You can look up in the encyclopedia. This is what they did on the Day of Atonement. You'll find on the Day of Atonement, they took off jewelry. Do you know that an Orthodox Jew, on the Day of Atonement, he even took off his wedding band? Do you know that you could wear jewelry in the outer court? You'll find Abraham had jewelry on. You'll find many people in Israel sometimes had jewelry on, but they never wore it on the Day of, because timing regulates everything that we, now let's read this together. Let me blow it up so you can see it. It says, Yom Kippur, it's called the Sabbath of the Sabbaths. It says that, in fact, the women wear dresses. They didn't wear pants. Women don't wear pants on the Day of Atonement. They only wore skirts or dresses. But then it says, Temple do the gold garments are not worn on what? This day of asking forgiveness because it represents Hebrews, human majesty, and our potential reminder of the sin of the golden calf. Young Kippur is a day of humility, a low and private profile. Fancy garments, especially gold garments, are really out of place and are contrary to the prevailing spirit of this what? On the Day of Atonement, you don't wear this. Now, brothers and sisters, it says that if, if, if all Israel in the typical service were required to go about the sanctuary and do this, and if they didn't do this, they were what? Cut off. How much more essential is this antitypical Day of Atonement that we understand the work of our high priest and know what duties are required of us? Now, somebody says, but Lord, I can't make these changes. If we're not willing to give up anything, you know what that shows? We love these things more than we love what? Jesus. Inspiration tells us, it says, those who have bracelets and wear gold and ornaments had better take these what? Do you know if you read Genesis 35 verses 1 through 4, maybe tomorrow we'll talk about it. The Bible says that the jewelry is idols and idols is violating the first commandment. It's sin to put on these idols when you know better. It says to those who have bracelets and wear gold and ornaments had better take these idols from their what? And do what? Sell them. Somebody says, I don't know where to sell them. Well, in America, I don't know about Trinidad, but I've seen people walking around saying, we buy gold. <laughs> Even if it should be for far much less than they gave for them, and thus practice what? Why? Time is what? Everything is regulated by time. There's a time to everything under the heaven, a time to every purpose under the heaven. It says, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is what? That means our diet, our drinking, our dressing, our living, our education, our life. There should be a complete revival and reformation. Everything about us should change. For if we're in Christ, we become a new creature. And if we're not willing to do this, that means that we love that thing more than we love Jesus. Time is too short. And I'm going to show you tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'm going to show you. I was going to show you tonight, but I can't show you tonight. Tomorrow, I'm going to show you. It's over, brothers and sisters. The Sunday law is getting ready to be passed, and we're holding on to jewelry. We're holding on to pride. We're holding on to self-righteousness. We're holding on to everything instead of holding on to Jesus. What do we need in order to give these things up? Only one thing. You know what we need? Love. For God so loved the world that he won. And if all we need is love. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. The problem is we love the world but we do not love Jesus. What would you exchange for your soul? 
Can you imagine you hold on to all these things, but then you're lost? What's more important than Jesus? We need to examine ourselves. Do you see this is serious, yes or no? None of us are ready. Not one of us. Some of us, we may have taken off jewelry. Some of us, we may have changed our diet. Some of us, but I'm going to tell you something. If a man is sick, he's coughing, his nose is running, I just go over and I just wipe his nose, is the man healthy now? No. Something has to happen where? So just making the change on the outside is not enough. You must have not only clean hands on the outside. We need a pure heart on the inside. And do you know that you can do all this and not have a pure heart? There's only one person. What can make me pure within? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But if you want that blood, not only does God have a part, but we have a part. Heavenly Father, I have said what you have told me to say. We are the antitypical day of atonement, dear God. And many things in our life is not right. Should judgment pass to the dead, to the living right now, all of us will be cut off. All of us will receive the mark of the beast, showing that we have not been brought back to perfection, but that we're incomplete. But you promised, Lord, that that which you began, you would finish. You would complete that which you started. This is the promise of Jesus. But, Lord, we're so addicted to the world, its music, its fashion, its clothes, its diet, its affections, its styles. And, Lord, we cannot break this by ourselves. Without Jesus, we can do nothing. But you promised we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And tonight... You say, Lord, it's a hard saying like Peter, but where else am I going to go? This is Bible. This is spirit of prophecy. This is even true for life. That it's a better way of living. We save money and time. We see the simplicity, save homes, healthier, holier, happier, better. But dear Lord, the devil has tricked us. I pause the prayer. There's someone that says, Lord, I'm like that publican. I can't even lift up my head, dear God. Father, you know what I did. I, I, I came today, dear God. And I drove through the street and saw our dear beloved sisters in Trinidad. And my heart went out to see people in the streets listening to music, never once hearing this message, and we're playing around church as some of the Adventists, dear God. Please forgive us. That we've called ourselves by your name. But we want to wear our own clothes and eat our own bread and yet call you master and want to be called by your name. Dear God. Show us, Lord, that your name is on the line. That true beauty is at the heart. That we will take all of this off. You won't have a church without makeup, without dress, without false music. You're going to have it without blemish to vindicate your character. And dear God, tonight I want to be a part of that team. If tonight you hear the voice of Jesus and you want to follow Jesus, you know that you can't do it without him, but you know that tonight that if you were to be, if the Sunday law were to pass, the time of trouble, if you were to die, that it would be over tonight. But tonight you want Jesus. Just raise your hand wherever you are. By raising your hand, you're saying, dear Jesus, I need help. There are changes that need to be made, but I can't do it without you. But with you, my food needs to be changed. I need to clean up my icebox tonight. Things need to be taken off of my ears tonight. Things need to be a decision needs to be made tonight. How long will we be hurt between two opinions? We can't be whirlings and seven and minutes at the same time. We're going to be distinct and different. There needs to be changes made tonight or the devil will come in. Jesus said to Judas, whatever you do, do quickly. Don't let someone come and say, you don't have to do this. You better know that Jesus is making up his number right now. And everybody's not going to do it, but God is going to have a remnant. Are you going to be a part of that team tonight? You want the help of Jesus. Father, you see the lifted hands. I'm lifting my hands because I need you, Lord. Lord, we need changes on the outside. But first, give us Pure hearts. Create us clean hearts, oh God. Do that for every lifted hand. And if there's any hand not lifted, in the back, outside, somewhere else, upstairs or down, don't let anyone sleep tonight or be comfortable. Alarm us, Lord, not so you can condemn us, but that we might be awakened so that we can be saved by Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated for a silent moment of meditation. Are you happy you were here tonight? Do you want some more? Tomorrow night, I didn't hear everybody at that time. Praise God. Tomorrow night, we're going deeper. Amen? Let's ask God to help us. Amen? When we leave tonight, let's leave solemnly. Let's leave prayerfully. Let's not just joke around, talk with each other. We need to talk to Jesus tonight. There's some changes that need to be made. Amen? Let's make a decision. Amen? If there are no announcements tonight, we will get ready to commit and consider ourselves dismissed. Let's leave out quietly respectfully, and we'll be looking to see you tomorrow. Amen? Amen. May God bless you.